Hello, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Applied AI, Accelerating Impact at Customer Service. Um, looking forward to a lively discussion here. This is a, a very timely topic. There's been a lot of uh, excitement and, and expectations around AI this year, around large language models and generative AI. Um, and we're looking forward to what's going to happen in the coming year. Um, and I'm glad you're all here to join us in this discussion. Um, I am Derek Topp. I'm the research director and senior analyst with Opus Research and I'm the moderator here. And uh, excited to have uh, Dan Miller, who's lead, lead on us with Opus Research and Professor Lamont Arslan, who's uh, with Sestech. So I'll let them um, introduce themselves. And uh, I just actually, uh, before I, I do that, I do want to mention that today is a live webinar. It is interactive. We want you guys to, anyone and everyone to uh, ask questions, make comments. You know, what are you, what's your opinion about applying AI? How can it be uh, re reasonably done? <laughs> what are some real time, uh, real world use cases that you're seeing in, in, in your organizations and any questions you might have, please feel free to click that ask a question button right under the, the screen that you that you have in Bright Talk. Um, and, and we'll get to them either during the live discussion or at, we have also a planned Q&A at the end. So, um, all right. Yes, I'm, I'm Derek. I'm uh, with Opus. Dan, tell us about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm thinking myself as the OG of AI, okay? Oh, and, nice. And I, I was like just <laughs> having a conversation this morning with my brother, and he said, oh, what's happening? What's new in AI? And I was just saying, what is, I mean, in, in you know, I, I was the first analyst back in 1980. This is without a doubt the most revolutionary phenomenon in new technologies. Uh, you know, when you think about web browser, you think about mobile smartphones, go down the list. This is pervasive and this is everywhere. And, and there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop there um, and turn it over to Levon to do a brief introduction and then we'll get into it. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, this is Levent Arslan here. I mean, I'm a professor at university uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, and also I'm founder of Sestek. Uh, we have been in this field for more than 23 years now, uh, and we started with speech technology and we extended it to natural language processing uh, technology. And now uh, we are using AI in almost all our products uh, and we are trying to uh, basically adapt LLMs uh, in different uh, products. Cool. Yeah, and I think we'll get into some of the applications and, and uh, um, uh, use cases you guys, you, that Sestech has as we get through today's discussion. So just real quick, high level, we'll, we'll, um, here's the agenda that we'll get, get through. Um, today, we're going to start off with some survey data points <laughs> looking specifically at AI and how uh, organizations are thinking about them and, and generative AI and what, what they're kind of, um, you know, kind of where they are on the, on the timeline, the evolution of, of, of AI. Um, we're going to look through, you know, some of the, the, the values. We'll, we'll actually dig a little deeper in terms of what, it, what LLMs do, um, look at some of the um, you know, kind of inputs and outputs and specific use cases. Uh, and then there's a lot of common misconceptions out there right now, um, or, or potentially real conceptions, but <laughs> around the pitfalls um, when it comes to opportunities for, for AI. Um, how should organizations be thinking about large language models? How do you actually then apply them to your own company-specific uh, information and, and, your, and your business cases? Uh, and, and as mentioned, yes, we'll look at some case studies in automation and analysis, uh, and then some kind of key takeaways as, you, uh, as we end our year here, Dan, Dan and, uh, and our team can... Uh, provide some insights on what you should be thinking about um, as we go forward. And of course, as, as mentioned, yeah, there's a Q&A at the end. So please, you know, feel free to, again, to ask questions either throughout. Um, if not, we'll also um, address some questions at the end. Um, so yeah, real quick, Opus, you know, we're, we're a third party uh, analyst organization. We do cover conversational AI, um, what we call conversational intelligence and, and as well as authentication and, and, um, and analytics. Uh, we did. Pr we had a, a survey earlier this year, so this is some from some months back. But we had a, a survey of 250. We surveyed 250 uh, decision makers in North America um, on a range of topics, but um, specific to this conversation, uh, we asked around AI and automation, and what are what are some ways that are that are holding people back when it comes to realizing the full potential of AI and automation within organizations. Um, and we were, you know. I'm surprised to see is one word, but I mean, we, we did see a, a strong resistance right now um, around employee acceptance, around the, the idea, obviously, you know, we hear about, you know, AI is going to take our jobs or, you know, and this, this is specific to, you know, certainly to, can be specific to contact centers and, and customer service and really kind of having automation 
uh, become something that's you know a part of their daily lives. But but there's also just you know I think there's there's also some other reasons why employees um, are the highest you know when it comes to this question um, the the biggest resistance to um, uh, full, realizing the full potential. What what do you think about that, Dan? What's you know why why? <laughs> well, and I think rightfully so. So so yeah. if you look here, it's basically saying that you know over two thirds of sort of the friction against sort of total adoption of LLMs, generative AI, um, is 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 human based, mm -hmm. and and actually it's a cautionary tale that hey, I'm I'm a big proponent. You know, the world's divided between the the boomers and the doomers. I'm I'm on the side of optimism, um, but there there has to be some balance put around it that that um, take into account that there's kind of a resistance uh, in in business organizations to just sort of wholesale changing how you do things, um, and and you know, Levon and I will um, talk a little bit about this, but but it, it you know it speaks to the the first order concerns you have to address, which is probably around properly educating people about what it is, um, and 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 having training programs and and um, I hate the word orchestration, but we're talking about <laughs> orchestrating how, when, and where um, these implementations happen in a way that truly benefit people. <laughs> so so you know we you you framed it as hey we're going to look at the pitfalls here, um, but we're really really looking at the opportunities. Um, and and you know it starts out with people discovering how to work with this stuff in a way that. Um, automates the things that are boring and augments their performance in the stuff that they do. Levon, I, I think, you know, in our prep call, we talked a little bit about that, but um, you're seeing it in a practical sense with, with your with your customers. Yes, actually. I mean, uh, there's uh, in this uh, part of digital transformation uh, journey, for example. I mean, and uh, there is a change, basically, in the work environment. And uh, people are afraid of that change. I mean, when there's a change, uh, because they don't know very much about it, they may mm. have hesitations. And it's like that. Uh, I mean, for example, when you start playing tennis, I mean, first you uh, you're afraid to hit the ball and stuff like that. After a while, you get used to it. You learn more. You get more confident and. Uh, uh, it's as you say, then it's about education. Mm. So uh, what uh, we follow uh, is, I mean, not only the top management, but all the uh, parties involved in the digital transformation with the customers. We have a professional services team. Uh, we work together with them. Uh, we try to educate them as much as possible. Uh, we have training programs uh, throughout the project and before the project even. Uh, and after they get comfortable, it's much easier to uh, basically go ahead with the project and uh, yeah. do the deployment. And, and, yeah. and I think it's more true when you look at the, the second uh, bar here that, you know, close to half, <laughs> you know, there's, there's an issue with consumer acceptance or customer acceptance. And that's for real. You know, there, there have been precursor technologies that were the foundation of the chat bots and voice bots that were out there. Many of the early deployments um, kind of sucked. I mean, <laughs> no offense to anybody, but, but you know, success is going to breed success. And, you know, to my earlier point that the technology is evolving so quickly, um, there's, there are conversations being held between generative AI resources and people um, that are just astoundingly good. <laughs> and, and it's, it's going to be a ripple effect, but, it, but, you know, consumer, stop that, customer acceptance is, is going to be, you know, success will breed success. And we're just starting to have the ones that are just, you know, crazy good at, at what they're doing at, at um, understanding an intent really quickly, almost doing shopping on behalf or, or answering a question on behalf of the customer, anticipating, um, that stuff's happening right now. And, and you know, your, your technology demonstrably delivers on that. Yeah. And, and, and there's a question that just came in, and, and I'll, I'm actually going to move to the next slide just because I think it speaks to this a little bit too. Is that kind of um, 
education, that understanding of, of what these technologies all mean and how do you apply them within your organizations? The question was specific to centers of excellence in terms of how do you see that? Or is, is that a common approach? I mean, and which, which I think we have seen for certain, certainly from an enterprise standpoint um, with these new technologies, how are organizations you know, educating themselves um, and then also kind of working with their providers, with working with um, you know, other additional vendors to really kind of make, make them you know, maximize the, the technology potential from, from AI. Um, well, specific to, to AI here, but um, and, and yeah, I, I just just to you know to to point that to to this this slide here, there is a you know just ubiquitous understanding of of awareness of generative AI and large language models, but when it comes to actually applying them and making LLMs accessible to customers, we're you know from the same survey, we're seeing a very small percentage, less than you know three percent of organizations are actually making this stuff um, available to customers just yet, and I think. Again, like yeah, the, the, it's well. There's the you know the kind of the onslaught of new technologies, which can be overwhelming for many organizations and many people just to you know understand to start with. Let alone then, uh, how do you um, apply them with, within your organizations? What what are the steps that you need to, to make sure you're prepared for all of this um, from a data perspective, from a um, from a you know kind of who has access to the technology, um, and then then how do you you know not to mention the business impact itself? What, what's the cost? What's the what's the the value? So I think there's still a long way to go, but um, I don't know, Levant, yeah, is that something you're seeing in terms of this, there's a strong awareness, but when it comes to actually being put to work, it's still, Build, still the way Yes, way? exactly. We see it in the industry. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is people, everybody is talking about it, but when it comes to deployment, they are more hesitant, uh, just uh, like in your survey, uh, it's uh, verified on the field as well. And so there, I mean, uh, we are trying to, uh, comfort the customer. I mean, uh, for example, <laughs> LLMs are very good. I mean, they can give very realistic answers, uh, but at the same time, the companies, uh, when they are confronted with uh, the uh, the LLMs uh, alone, uh, they may give some answers which are not actually the answers that uh, the companies would like uh, to transmit to their customers okay i mean they may not be exactly the same ones so if you are there we are trying to follow a hybrid approach i mean where you can uh, customize your uh, prompts for specific uh, intents uh, in your own way and uh, let the uh, open ai do the rest of the work for example not always and open ai but yes so and there's a couple couple questions that, that came in that, that may be interesting to bring up in the context of these previous two slides because i know what the next slide is like and i think you're gonna uh Levant, get to do a, a a deep dive into sort of defining how best to look at this but but one here says you know there are cloud centers of excellence that help people with the cultural changes moving forward. Are there similar things, you know, centers for excellence doing the same thing among either your go-to-market partners or um, you yourself? You know, that some, sometimes you show the way by saying, you know, here, here's, here's excellence, behold, <laughs> and, and implement. Uh, yep, I mean, like, uh... For uh, education, actually, I mean, what we do is we try to tell all the uh, state of the art. I mean, what can achieve, what can, uh, where are the limitations, and how uh, we can uh, cover those uh, limitations. And uh, the way we go about it is we make, a, for example, POC with their own data, with OpenAI, for example, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. see uh, in their own uh, domain. Uh, what answers, what type of answers is giving to them? Okay, the customer mm -hmm. tests it, for example, and then they say, okay, uh, we don't like this. Uh, could it be like this? And we, uh, through our uh, tool, virtual agent interface, for example, we can figure out those uh, customizations, fine tunings uh, for them, mm -hmm. uh, for the test that they want uh, in their own way. Uh, then they start realizing what uh, the tools are capable and how we can uh, together formulate the best solution for them. And they see it along the way. I mean, we try to keep them in the loop 
so that they can see what's going on and how uh, these uh, problems are mitigated. Uh, then that way is a much uh, better experience. Uh, for the customer. It's uh, like an education on the job training, you can think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and when I think of the title of, of this webcast, Accelerating Impact on Customer Service, acceleration in some ways is happening because the technology is is the, the refresh of you know the latest way to do something is accelerating. So one of the roles you're playing and, and your cohort of solution providers is sort of putting, my epiphany was, hey, we're, we, you know, whether we're a developer of an app, whether we're the agent, you know, with, with an assistant, whether we're a customer talking to a bot, we're conversing with it. So this is the first sort of conversational acceleration of technology that, that we've seen. And, and it, you know, it's just remarkable. Yeah, and that's interesting. I, I mean, I just, there was a question that came in, does, does um, employee acceptance affect customer acceptance? And I think to, to that point, like getting an understanding from an employee perspective of what how these technologies work, how to make them useful for yourself will ultimately translate to better customer you know, satisfaction or ultimately you think you have better service. So so I think there there is a loop there that's about um, employee understanding of the technology and applying them specific to uh, you know, workflows and specific business, in, uh, business roles in the organization. Um, so along that line, let's. I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide, just to, and have Levant kind of walk through. Let's we're, let's go a little deeper dive into what you know. What do LLMs do, <laughs> and and how do they help organizations? Um, you know, specific to to really what how you know what, what's the what's what's changing about the current state of these technologies, and and how are they you know what, what's the ultimate output from a from a business standpoint? Okay, here uh, is a list of topics uh, that we is of course LLMs use cases are not limited to those. Uh, it can address more topics uh, than listed here, but these are the ones that we actually implemented and uh, we got use from it. I mean, uh, and the customers are already using uh, these ones uh, that we list here. Uh, for example, in intent classification, uh, the input utterances are input and the intents are given as the output. This is one trivial example of uh, LLMs mm -hmm. uh, use cases. Uh, for dialogue summarizations, uh, customer agent dialogues are uh, summarized uh, through GPT. Uh, and uh, this is actually pretty useful because um, a longer uh, sequence of events can be summarized. And after the summarization, you can use it uh, much better. I mean, and you can uh, correlate uh, things much easier that way. For example, if you want to do topic clustering uh, and you want to uncover topics, doing summarization first helps you uh, understand mm -hmm. uh, what type of uh, clusters are available in your contact center much easier. Uh, that are relevant topics, let's say. Uh, intent induction is uh, actually a byproduct of dialogue summarization. Uh, first, you do the summaries, then, then uh, you try to list all the uh, intents that are available in a bunch of dialogues. Not a single dialogue, but a bunch of dialogues. For example, you can give all the customer agent conversations uh, to the system and then you can uh, first summarize those and then the summaries are given to the open ai system and you can ask for uh, the most uh, available most frequent uh, intents uh, among those dialogues for example and these you can do by prompt engineering for example mm -hmm. uh, of chat gpt uh, very easily. Then there's text sentiment, uh, which is obvious. Uh, you want to understand the sentiment of the uh, customer uh, throughout the uh, dialogue. Uh, or text embedding is a front end feature. For example, any text or a dialogue can be entered to the transformer GPT model and you can get embeddings for it. Then based on those embeddings, similar dialogues or similar text can be identified much easier. Right. 
Yeah. And the last one is generated Q&A, uh, which is also very important. For example, we have web pages or lots of documents in your company where lots of information is available. And you want to get uh, some answers uh, based on those uh, available information. And this information keeps updated all the time, okay? Throughout time, uh, the organization has new uh, features, new products, etc. all of those things. Uh, this automatically can be uh, generated. Uh, the documents are fed into the system. And then, then you can ask questions about those uh, documents uh, for this is called generative Q&A for us, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and what, what, what I like about this slide um, is twofold. One is this is sort of depicting what we've been calling the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that the technology does really well, summarization, the generating q and you know, taking a large amount of information input and then just using this magic box, the, the transformer <laughs> or LLM yeah. um, to render it, to do, distill things and, and render it as output. And, and which leads to the second point, what's important here is, is as um, this conversational model for adoption, you know, whether you call it co-pilot or, or what have you, <laughs> where um, individuals, be they a developer, the agent, him or herself, or the, or the customer, um, they're, they're providing, um, they're, you know, they have to think, they have a task to accomplish. There's a defined set of input and, and think about, you know, that, that deserves sort of attention um, and then goes into the uh, transformer and it's rendered as output. And those are the two domains that as you think about implementing a solution that involves LLMs, involves Gen AI, um, Try to keep them separate. You know, keep the task in mind. Understand what the input is going in there. Because even though you know we're talking about this advanced um, technology, it's still garbage in, garbage out, like any computer system out there. So you know, pay attention to that. And then outputs can be refined um, uh, on a use case by use case basis. And and that's a different kind of role for humans as we converse with the um, the thing. <laughs> Um, to get the results we're looking for. So uh, that's what I liked about this slide and the framing here and, and what solutions look like. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. I think that, I mean, that does kind of provide the, the, the true potential um, and, and uh, what can uh, obviously on, on the output side of what can help these organizations. Um, well, Dan, now let's get into what what are the risks? Why, why, do you, <laughs> why, why should we be scared of these things? And so... Um, <laughs> Right, and and we'll play. We'll speaking of tennis, we'll we'll volley back and forth here. The one is um, and notice that you called it risk, Derek, but it's opportunities. There you and go. Risk. Okay. So, and and some of this is just addressing what uh, the popular press is is characterizing as the deficiencies of the solutions these days. And number one starts with, hey, these LLM, LLMs lack specialized expertise. That you know when you're dealing well and and let's say think eight months back when 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 you're thinking about open ai it was gpt three and a half or four um uh google hadn't really come across with um their answer there were there were, you know there are hundreds of llm solutions out there but they seem to be uh, they don't seem to be but they're trained on massive amounts of data that could range from uh reddit to the complete works of Shakespeare or, or to a Mexican telenovela or something. Um, and, and one has to ask oneself, if you're a business, um, what does this have to do with my customers, with my product uh, database and that sort of thing? And um, the answer is, and this is where I lob it over to LeBron, is, is there, um, there's a role for the LLMs and they're really good at rendering uh, responses in a way that you can conversationally tune. And then there's a way to have it intermingle with your company specific, domain specific or company specific information. And I'll, I'll, that's where I love it over to you to perhaps give an example here. Lamont. 
Yes, I mean like uh, LLMs are very good for generic uh, and wide range of uh, knowledge. I mean, uh, they can give you answer about uh, almost anything now uh, and they are great. I mean, it's a great tool really uh, because uh, usually previously we were having uh, chatbots or uh, NLUs, but uh, it was targeted for a specific domain. Out of the main questions, they were not being handled very well, I mean. Uh, and uh, there, I mean, the customers uh, were sort of, I mean, losing their confidence when they try something different, okay? Uh, out of context, let's say. Uh, LLMs uh, gave us this great power. Uh, they are complementary to the domain. Uh, everything else other than the domain can be answered uh, by the LLMs, even uh, in domain. Uh, they are uh, they they are doing a reasonable job, but in domain you can fine tune and get better than uh, LLM or uh, whatever LLM is missing or uh, not giving the message that you want them to give. For example, uh, you can uh, cover uh, cover up for it, <laughs> like basically. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <clears throat> well, I think if you replace the word generic in this number one with foundation, <clears throat> you're you're defining a model it, it, where you're not covering up, <laughs> you're right. augmenting, you're, you know, you're establishing a, an architecture where your <clears throat> company's data can um, be part of, can be input as part of a prompt to tailor it. Um, you'll notice, you know, OpenAI's introduction of GPTs for everything. Um, yeah. um, there are new architectures that are inviting users, enterprise users, to um, tailor, <laughs> not cover up, but but to, to sort of tailor both <laughs> the tailor, the input, yes. well, and and the output uh, for domain specific uh, instances. So this is less of a problem than it used to be. Um, uh, and then you, my point is you look to solution providers like Sestech to define how um, this company specific data is, you know, ethically, safely, um, uh, effectively uh, sort of merged with the, the, the you know, LLM stuff to, <laughs> to be actually uh, use case. I mean, even in that case, I mean, even if you train for your customer specific needs, for example, uh, recently we had a uh, food chain. Uh, we were mm -hmm. we showed them uh, OpenAI based Q and A uh, from their documents, basically. Mm -hmm. And then, based on the documents, for example, in one part of the world, it was a world line chain, uh, a worldwide chain, mm -hmm. food chain, uh, mm -hmm. and in one region, pork is not allowed, for example, in Muslim countries, let's say. Uh, and in other regions, uh, it's allowed. I mean, it's available in the store, for example. Mm -hmm. And when you ask, ask that question to, uh, to the chat, it should give different answers for different regions, okay? Uh, in one region, it should say, uh, no, we don't uh, have uh, this uh, ingredient in our products. And in the other region, it should say, yes, we are providing that. Uh, so this sort of, uh, this is a very simple example of, I mean, where you need sort of like fine tuning or uh, customization uh, for the direct chat GPT result from documents, let's yeah. say. Yeah. And I think what's interesting there is you used to have to hardwire and have branches in some tr uh, response tree um, to, to build something that could answer like that. Now you can sort of put it in the prompt that, hey, this applies here, here, and here, not here, and it knows. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, let, we'll move to, to the, to the yeah. second one, which... Um, so we... And, and, and we, we we'll talked about this a little bit. Quickly because we yeah. spent a lot of time talking about you know, resistance from employees and customers. Um, and I would say, and we have a question specifically about this now that um, that's saying, hey, how, how do you compensate for failure 
uh, in the first, you know, in the first place. And and I would say, hey, that's exactly where we're at. <laughs> there were precursor technologies that were a little rigid. Too much stuff was out out of bounds from what it knew about. So there there's just been a tendency forever to to try for a, for a customer to try to talk to a person rather than get effective results from whatever bot they're talking to. And, and um, you know, we have this question, how do you handle the failure with customers for LLMs in the first place? And I, I don't know if we're there yet. We're, what we're still trying to do is correct, handle the failure of, of bots in general um, over time. And, and, you know, do you have advice that, that you're telling? I mean, we know there's a demand to, you know, effectively put AI into the workflows of, um, the agents in terms of agent assistant and, and with customers in the in the form of bots and there's kind of a resistance based on the past performance of, of bots and and i'm you know like to talk through that yeah um i mean for uh, there i think there's still uh some time where we need professional services team i mean in mm. our case we have a product development team and a very large professional services team because we feel that both for the training of the customer about educating the customer about these technologies and also throughout the project uh, you need to do uh, fine tuning always towards the needs of the customer there is going to be always some customer touch and customer needs are going to be changing uh, even during the throughout the project it changes yeah. i mean uh, what they want initially uh, they realize at some point that there are things that they haven't thought about and uh, they see those and it's a co constantly changing environment basically uh, llms are uh, basically they are helping a great deal and they're, they're a great tool but it's not the answer for everything i mean right. like and uh, you need that uh, professional touch i mean services touch uh, with a knowledgeable person even prompt engineering is a is an uh, important issue you have to be knowledgeable about the field uh, the a vertical and what are the needs of the customers and how you formulate those uh, there's going to be always uh, those sort of uh, effects and we think uh, there's going to be a good or there should be a good orchestration of uh, the llms and the humans yeah you should uh, use both of them together <laughs> that that's for sure um in the interest of time, um, we'll be a little quicker with it. So we, we do have a question um, that is exact, that maps directly to the next one, the privacy, security, and compliance concerns. Um, you know, as you think about the data that companies have, what we call conversational intelligence, um, to help either train a model, you know, a, a company's own LLM or, or domain specific, a company specific LLM, um, or to be incorporated into prompts, um, there's a lot of concern about what's uh, politely called leakage, <laughs> you know, that, that personal data ends up somewhere else. <laughs> um, how, you know, is, is there like a short description of how you guys address um, these sorts of things? Uh, we, uh, we focus on that topic uh, very much actually, and uh, we mask, uh, the data uh, from named entities that are specific uh, to personal information and we are using AI to help locate those instances and basically you need to clear the data in a fashion before sending it to uh, LLMs. Uh, although, I mean, OpenAI is stating that uh, they are giving uh, assurance uh, that, I mean, they are not going to be using that data uh, and all that. But I mean, still, right. uh, once you go to internet, if it's mm -hmm. company specific data, uh, for example, a bank data or whatever, I mean, like, uh, 
there's always uh, some sensitivity about this topic and the customers, uh, they want assurances. And you need to uh, help them with technology and prove them that uh, their data is not uh, leaked. Uh, this is very important. This can be an obstacle in some cases because there are departments, security departments, uh, because their job is that to uh, be secure. Uh, yeah. And there's always a battle between the uh, business departments and the security departments in that sense. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and the, there's, the, the there's always department. a trade off, by the way. Legal, legal departments, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Legal departments. Yeah, the legal department as well. So I'm going to conflate uh, four and five because it, it maps to one of the questions here. That um, So there, there had been concern that, you know, conversations with an LLM go sideways and get off topic. Uh, in the past, um, and 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 oh, like you, uh, we lost you, Dan. Dan, yeah, you're, you're, we hear. lost your your microphone or something. Was um, you still still on mute? I'm not sure. Um, I think it's I think it was I think it's your microphone itself. Uh, maybe, but um. Is this, is it working? There you go. Now we can hear you. Yeah. We can hear Okay. My phone seized. <laughs> Thank yeah. you at Apple. My phone took over. But anyway, what I, what I, what I was trying to say is um, that what, one of the things we've been hearing is even if you use the same LLM and, and you have historically um, gotten certain questions answered, something may happen internal to, to that third party LLM over time and it starts giving different answers. So, you know, to your point, Levant, you, you keep humans in the loop, uh, checking both input and output and, and sort of making sure it squares up because everything's a moving target in, in our brave new world here. Yep, exactly. Uh, actually, Ch with ChatGPT four uh, Turbo, they mentioned. I mean, uh, OpenAI mentioned that you can uh, allocate a seed for the answers, then it can consistently give the same answer, uh, which is something that uh, they released. Uh, but still, uh, for example, let's say ChatGPT four, you have a, a definitive answer. What happens when you go to 4.5? How you guarantee yeah. that it yeah. gives yeah. you the same answer? I mean, like it, there is going to be always some. Uh, since you are training over a very large uh, set, it's going to be difficult uh, to balance the consistency uh, yeah. in your answers. Yeah, no, I think I mean that's going to be the 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 mode of many organizations is just going to be adaptability, just be, be ready for anything as, as, as both LLMs change or the organizations that, um, you know, the, the quote unquote hyperscalers as we call them um, are kind of changing and, and adopting and, and releasing new, new LLMs. And how do you make sure that your organization is prepared for, for all of that? And, and then I'll just be pre prepared for the unknown. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to go, let's go ahead and pass it to you, Levant, for the, uh, the next couple of slides, just to let, let's talk about how this grounds in real world, <laughs> customers and like how, how are they how are they using you know um technology such as ai for automation and for analytics and and really how does it how does it help them their organization so um so yeah i'll, I'll have you walk through the, the next couple pretty quickly uh, okay uh, we have a couple of uh, case studies uh, one of them uh, is an interesting topic I immigration is a big issue currently worldwide uh, with all the wars and everything going on and mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a social uh, thing, I would say. I mean, there are many people are suffering uh, from those uh, incidents, uh, immigration issues. And uh, Turkish Immigration Office uh, asked, uh, asked about the uh, AI-based uh, conversational IVR. Uh, and we developed uh, the IVR in seven languages uh, with conversational uh, AI technology. And we had 96% speech recognition accuracy uh, for the seven languages that we covered here, uh, Turkish, English, Arabic, German, Russian, Persian, Pashto. 
And even with Pash 2, we had 80, over 85% mean navigation accuracy. Uh, for the uh, low resource languages, it's very difficult to achieve that level mm -hmm. actually. <clears throat> Uh, especially for the low resource languages. For uh, English or Turkish, it's, it's much easier. Or, of course, <laughs> it's much higher, over 95%, I would say, routing accuracy. But even for uh, very low resource languages like Pashto, uh, we were able to get uh, over 85% uh, main navigation accuracy. And uh, that way, they can uh, learn things about their visas or immigration statuses, etc. All of those uh, questions can be answered uh, in their own language. Uh, that's a big relief for them, actually. Mm. And as you it think... Was of, also you know, social, socially, I mean, it was, we were happy to uh, have that project yeah. uh, successfully delivered. And I think as you look at global expansion um, for... <laughs> You know this this sort of application. You know you, you add Spanish, you add some of the Western European countries. You you add um, the Pacific Rim languages. Um, it this shows it for the you know the seven that were specifically addressed here. But there's a number that this idea of handling multiple languages is just really powerful across applications and around the globe. Yes, I mean, normally we support 26 languages natively, mm -hmm. but here in this project, specific project, uh, we use uh, seven languages. Uh, normally we do projects with one or two languages uh, in general, yeah. but for this project, uh, this was it's especially seven. important because it was uh, seven uh, languages. Yeah. So, and then if, if we start, you know, we've observed that a lot of the implementations of AI in enterprises start with agent assistance or supervisors of, of agents assistance. And that um, I, I think this, this use case dr dramatizes that. Yes, I mean, here, uh, Hefibrada is one of the largest uh, e-commerce companies in Turkey. Uh, and uh, in their quality management process, uh, we use analytics and automated quality management uh, tools, our products. And uh, they saw a 25% increase in uh, quality management efficiency. So basically, uh, they were able to evaluate um, more calls with uh, less personnel, less, uh, I would say. Uh, because routine tasks, for example, opening, closing scripts, etc., routine uh, scoring uh, was done uh, by uh, our automated uh, QM uh, module. Uh, they were more into uh, like uh, customer touch, uh, empathy, mm -hmm. those sort of things maybe. Uh, were analyzed by the human uh, quality management specialists. Uh, and also they have seen uh, 17 times increase in the number of agent evaluations. Uh, so uh, <laughs> not just random evaluations, but uh, most of the calls were being evaluated this way. Yes. Uh, and also uh, based on the insights that they received from the analytics uh, tool, uh, the supervisors uh, were able to give 21% more feedback uh, than they used to give. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, also something uh, good because <laughs> they know more uh, about the issues and problems the agents are facing uh, in their communications with the customers. Uh, that yeah. way, uh, helping them out about with uh, more targeted feedback uh, was uh, very valuable in that sense. And I think that translates into operational efficiencies that mm -hmm. have an impact on the, the bottom line, importantly. Exactly. So um, I'm going to zip through this in the interest of time as quickly as I can, because, you know, we want to, you know, this was about accelerating AI within, you know, the, the customer environment. I think our takeaways looking into the next year and beyond and is um, th this is all fed by data. When you think of the chart that had the input and output, um, we are, we're 
able to apply AI in ways, and, and you just brought this up, Levon, <laughs> that you extract insights across um, your entire organization and you apply it um, both to improve operational efficiencies, to improve customer experience, to, to get faster answers. Um, and we're entering a world where that information is the product of intermingling these large language models and um, company specific stuff. Um, and that that information is, is, you know, it used to be very labor intensive to quote, curate these things. And now we're, it's sort of getting aggregated almost, well, I won't say it's almost automatic. It's, it's, it has to be well thought out, <laughs> but you don't care whether it's structured, unstructured, whether it's a transcript or it's something in a PDF, these, these machines read all this stuff, uh, ingest it and subject it to the kind of AI driven analytics that, that really do improve both CX and, 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 and uh, employee performance. Um, at, at the same time, we're, uh, you know, as, as if, if there's a scale of, you know, you're either automating something or you're aug augmenting people, um, we've really created different roles for individuals. Um, so, <clears throat> We may, we're going to hear the tale of automation, um, but you know, there's a role for the individuals looking at the input, making sure it's the right quality, uh, governing that you know, private stuff gets redacted, go down the list. There's, there's new sorts of professions in this, you know, cure, whatever succeeds curation is what you do with the knowledge. Um, they're architecting prompts, you know, it's kind of a glorified way of saying, hey, well, as you converse with the AI, people are getting better at, at sort of uh, crafting the things that get the right results when you look at the output. So that, that sort of input um, curation, if you will. And then there's this role of, of, of you know, being there to look at the responses, uh, trying to, uh, you know, maintain consistency and, and that sort of thing. Um, and in the short term, um, we're at a period of overcoming those barriers that we exposed here that, you know, we, there's budgetary constraints. This is what we um, hear a lot of. Um, uh, you do have to promote employee and customer acceptance. We already talked about that and address the legal, ethical and regulatory strictures always. <laughs> um, but in our prep call, we sort of close with this comment that, that what we're really driving that is going to accelerate acceptance is, is building some sort of peace of mind <laughs> with um, these resources that are handling voluminous amounts of data and and that's our role as humans in this in this AI driven world and and I'll stop there um, uh, there turn it over to you um, yeah no I think we're I think we're I'd love to kind of have final comments um, from both Levant and, and yourself Dan. but but I think and we are kind of at time so um, we'll be brief about this but but I but I do think it, it is that you know the 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 voluminous amounts of data is like there is a sense of being overwhelmed with AI right now. And, and, and I, I know we see that in terms of the employee acceptance. We see it in terms of finding the right use cases, and the right business model. Um, you know, so I think, you know, Levant, just like as, as a practical piece of advice, how, 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 are your, how would, you know, are you counseling organizations um, when it comes to this and, and to kind of, you know, get, get, point themselves in the right direction to make sure they're taking advantage of, uh, of applying AI for, for the customer service? Um, one thing is, I mean, uh, to consolidate data and to use, for example, if you are if you have a self-service system, and if you need to analyze it as well, self-service and analytics they go hand in hand. We think uh, so. Uh, if you are going to go uh, with a vendor, you, the vendor should cover both areas. I think that way the data can be transferred from one system to the other. For example. In your self-service, for example, you have some chatbots, uh, chatbot conversations, etc. for example, and there are some uh, problems with it. The analytics analyzes those and then gets back uh, with advices on correcting them. Then you correct those and you analyze again. So it's a back and forth uh, process. I mean, uh, in automating your uh, services, uh, the most important thing is uh, you should analyze what you are automating. Uh, that's my advice. I mean, uh, yeah. you should uh, implement both systems at the same time. Yeah. 
No, I think that's good advice. I think that, I mean, if you find real value from that and then look, working with employees, to, you're going to help your customers. So, um, and then analyzing those conversations is truly a, an important step. Um, so we are at time. Definitely appreciate everyone joining us for, for this, this hour. And we look forward to this conversation a year from now. Who knows what's going to happen, right? Yeah. So, uh, exactly. <laughs> um, and maybe sooner. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.